Can you see that okay? Yep. We're uh, negotiating a, a different uh, different set of electronical equipment tonight, uh, so I ho hope everybody can see that. I think it will clear up a little bit maybe as it gets used to my machine. Thank you for coming out tonight. I've got, um, got about 40 minutes to go as, as smoothly as we can to try to get as much accomplished that the Lord would have for us. I'm very excited. I, I wish that I could uh, get to you the way, uh, or the, the, the presentation, the way it happens when no one's around. But inevitably, you get in front of people and everything starts to speed up a little bit and your mind starts to work a little slower and so on. So I, I trust the Lord that uh, what we have tonight will be profitable and productive for the future of each of us as we learn to grow in favor with God and man. That is the goal of this. And so for the first few slides, I do want to focus on the relationship with the Lord just for a couple of slides, because if you can figure out this part of communication, if you can learn to listen to the Lord and speak with the Lord, then you will be much more prepared and better equipped to communicate with others throughout the world. To build a better relationship with God, to build a better relationship with others. It, that's, it's that, that simple. To be intentional. If there's, yes. if there's one thing when it comes to communication that I can stress to you, it's to be intentional. To help you leave with one thing you can change in your communication. And as we mentioned last time, if you can get to two, great, but don't lower your chances of remembering one or two if you try to get three. So please keep that in mind because there's a lot of material, and I'd rather have you pick up one or two and then come back later for more. So this is how we broke it down when we uh, presented this at the retreat and, and when we did this a couple of weeks ago. Four, four parts of communicating. Hearing God. So quickly, this was an analogy that we used on the retreat, and I hope it's helpful to you. There's a phone getting ready to be charged. Hearing God. Reading the Bible is like charging your phone. This may be simple, but I think it's profound if you will yes. think about how yes. it applies. Yes. If you fail to charge your phone, it will be unusable when needed. So this is how it happens. You get up, you're a little late, you run off, you get in the car, you head to work, you go to school. The world starts to, to focus in around you. You've got things going on, and all of a sudden you need an answer. You need help. You need encouragement. You need to give an answer to somebody else. And you go to your repertoire that is now empty because you forgot to charge your phone when you left the house that day. And you do that a couple times in a row, and all of a sudden your battery is, is flat gone. You'll need an answer. You'll need comfort. Something's going to happen during the day where you are going to want to be able to recall something that the Lord has said to you and if you have not spent the time in his word and therefore charged up your mental phone with God's word, then you're going to find yourself wanting. We get out there in the world and we wonder, why does God not speak to us? And why don't we have the answers that we need? It's because we did not charge our phone. I hope that's helpful. It was a way that we presented to the youth that yes, made sense. Excellent. And when you're sitting down and you open the scriptures, I hope you feel like you are literally yes. trying to charge yes. your spirit for the walk ahead. We had an, an opportunity during the retreat where this came to, to bear. Some, some last-minute changes happened. We needed to quickly adjust. And when those adjustments happened, we did not have the charged phone with the person that needed it at the right time so that everybody else was wondering what was happening and we weren't able to find out in a timely manner. The Lord was very merciful that it happened. And I was able to use it that night to be able to share, this is how it works. If you don't charge your phone, it, it, you, you know, it's one of those things where you charge your phone every day and you never need it as much. And then all of a sudden, one day you don't charge your phone, you go to it and it's dead. Keep that in mind. You need to be consistent with the Word of God. Okay, that's it. That's it on hearing God, talking with God. What we do, we mean when we say talking with God. So it's important to understand this part of it. When we, when we, when we mention talking with God, many times we think, well, I talk with God because I pray. We pray in church, we pray at meals, we pray in the morning, we pray at night. What I'm talking about when I, when I mention talking with God is a conversation. It is literally two people having a dialogue with one another. And if you will talk to the Lord, he will talk with you. It's building a relationship versus performing a review. And, and I mentioned this last time, but I think it's very important that we understand that when we go to talk to the Lord, it's not us going through a bullet point presentation with him about things that just happened in our lives. He knows what happened in your life. He wants to know what's going on with you, with him, and with your relationships and everything else. So it's the other part of talking with God. It's like speaking to a friend. And we have these examples throughout God's word. It's not just praying, although part of it. We tell our friends everything. And if you can think about talking with God as you would talk to a friend, then it will, I believe it will make more sense. Tell him everything. He knows it already. Let's not shortchange him thinking we're going to hide from him. You would not consider a good friend 
uh, someone that did not share things with you that you knew about them and knew you could help with them, and then they didn't tell those things to you because they were you know, scared or forgetful. Let's not be that way to the Lord. He knows our fears, our hopes, dreams. I mean, he knows it all. So let's just be honest with him and talk with him. Lord. He's asked you to talk with him. If God, has, if God has said everything to you that you would ever want to hear, which we described last time, he's told you he's loved you, he's told you he'll take care of you, he has literally said everything you could possibly want to hear. If that's so, then what have you not said to him? Where are you lacking in your part of the relationship with the Lord and talking with him? He's waiting to hear from you. It's not that he needs to hear from you in that he doesn't know what's going on. He needs to hear from you because he loves you and cares for you and wants the relationship that you're going to want when the storms of life show up, which we heard about in one of the hymns that we sung, the waves foaming out. Okay, that was just to remind you that it's very important that if you can figure out how to speak with and listen to the Lord, then everything else in your life will become easier and, and more yes. fulfilling. Yes. And you'll have the answers when you get into a conversation with somebody in the world. So the most important part of communication is learning to listen. We need to understand the temperaments and love languages, and we're not going to go into them again, but I implore you to remember that if you can understand the temperaments and the love languages, then that is a pair of glasses that will make that everything else will make more sense. There, there they are. We'll, we'll hit them again in a minute. There's another way to look at them. It kind of breaks it down. If, 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 for those of you that like kind of a pie chart type of view, there's the, the, the uh, love languages. It's a whole study in and of itself. Fascinating study. Books are written on it. I would, I would suggest that if you're interested in them, you know, get with somebody that has read one of those books, find a good one. Rules for ineffective listening. So when we started this, this whole, uh, the idea on communicating, one of the first questions that came up is, well, why, why don't we listen well? Why don't we communicate well? Familiarity breeds contempt. That's one of the number one reasons why we do not communicate well. You get into your, your, your everyday life, you're, you're around the same person so often that you let familiarity creep in and you expect them to understand everything instead of explaining it to them. And so we break the rules with those closest to us. They should be the ones we pay the closest attention yes. to. However, it's the opposite. Yes. We actually, when we're talking to anybody else, we're paying much more, much closer attention to them. We use comments like, they should know me. And you know, we've been married for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. They should know me by now. Well, that's not the way it is. You've changed. They've changed. Circumstances have changed. Everything's changed, and you have to be able to keep up with that. If I'm going too quickly, I want to get to the, to the meat of this, and I just want to, this is just to set that up again. This is the other, one of the other big reasons why you cannot hear people sometimes when you should. The inability to realize that not everybody is like you. You really need to realize that nobody is like you. Not some people are not like you. Nobody's like you. You are unique. And so when you go into a conversation with somebody, you need to realize that you are not talking to you. You are talking to them. Yes. And they are different from you. You've got to understand some of these, these differences in personalities and upbringing and experiences and so on. And if you can understand these different things, then when you go into a conversation, you understand that I'm not talking to me. I'm talking to a whole different set of circumstances here and experiences and so on. We assume instead of clarify. How often in a conversation do you check out halfway through the thought because you're pretty sure how it's going to end and so you've moved on to the next thought? We're going to get to, to you know, interruptions in, in a minute here and it, it, the only reason the interruption happens is because you're sure you figured it out. I can, I can guarantee you you haven't figured it all out. You may have figured out most of it, but let them finish and if you let them finish, you'll understand so much more and the way to do that is to clarify. And don't let your perception become the reality. And you, get into a, you get into a conversation and you're hearing them talk and you're thinking about you and your experiences and circumstances and you, you all of a sudden make their reality your reality. The problem is it's different. You've, you've perceived that, but it's very different. Listen to what was said, not what you heard. Okay, it's, it's, it, it sounds contradictory, but if you'll listen to what was said, what they're actually saying to you instead of what you're hearing, and that's how you have to clarify. I'm, I think I heard you say, and so you ask the clarifying question. Proactive versus reactive listening. And I'm just going to run through these for the, for the, the, the purpose of realizing that they're, they're both on either side, but they're complete opposite. So you've got focused, engaged, you clarify, you're intentional, you have good eye contact, you're letting the speaker lead the conversation, you're actually listening. Then you go to the reactive listening. So this is not someone that's in there proactively trying to learn something. This is someone that happened to get stuck in a conversation and is trying to figure out what to do with the information that's coming at them. So you start wandering with your, your, your thoughts. The, you start daydreaming. You become very assumptive as to what they're trying to say. 
You're disjointed in your thoughts when you try to respond because you haven't paid attention. There's very little eye contact, if, if any. The listener tries to lead. Now, see, this, that's an important point that when you're in a conversation, the listener can't lead. The listener has to follow. We'll, we'll hit that again in a moment, but, but please think about this. Think about communication as a dance. Okay, when you have a dance, you have two individuals that are, that are trying to do the same thing, but somebody has to lead in a dance, and somebody has to follow. That's, that's the only way a dance really works. And if that's true, then you've got to let the leader of the conversation lead the conversation. And if you don't do that, then you're going to fight them, and the dance is not going to work. You're going to misstep. Sure. You're going to step on toes. You're going to tangle up, and it's not going to look yes. very pretty in the process. And so you've got to, you've got to think about it as, a, as something like a dance. Looks for opportunities to speak and care less. I mean, they're really just not there. They're, they're just going to react when the opportunity arises, but they're not going to be proactive at all. Okay, some rules for effective listening. You've got to meet the speaker where they are. When you go into a conversation and they start talking and they're leading the conversation, you've got to understand where they are. Emotionally is probably the most important thing you need to understand. There's a, there's a proverb that says you don't, we don't sing songs to him that have a heavy heart. When you walk into a conversation and they've got a smile on their face and things are going well, you don't make, you know, be the wet blanket and vice versa. So meet them at their emotion. It's, it's called mirroring and reflecting if you do a study on it, but it's your ability to mirror whatever the emotion is that they're having right then. Effective listening. Body language is so important. There's a whole whole study that could, that could go on and on and on with body language. We're going to mention a few things in a moment, but for, this, for, for sake of right now, physical focus. So if you will focus on the physical side of how are they standing, how are they looking, are they crying, are they nodding, are they smiling, what are they doing, what are they doing with their stance, what are they doing with their hands, are they having any eye contact with you? All that is your physical focus with eye contact being number one. If you don't get anything else out of the, the, the body language exchange, it needs to, there needs to be eye contact yes. there. Some more rules for effective listening. The power of the pause. Now, we hit this last time, and several people came up and said this was, this was valuable to them. And I appreciate the youth that helped bring this, this out. But there's the quick pause. It's, it's, it's quick, two to three seconds, which to be as long, but for, you know, it's supposed to be quick. Then there's the slow pause. It's a little bit longer, three to four. And then we called it the pregnant pause, and that's actually what it's called. It's called a, a pregnant pause. I added whatever it takes to be uncomfortable because it seems like you know, most pregnant women, at least at some point during the pregnancy, become uncomfortable. And so it's whatever it takes to be uncomfortable. And for certain people, you know, for a choleric, it's not going to be as much as it would be for others. So I added this to, to bring this point out a little bit using the, the temperaments. The rules for effective listening with the power of the pause, the quick pause equals the choleric pause. Okay, It's a very quick, if you've got two or three seconds, it's time to go. It's time to go. What's next? Let's go. So that's, uh, then there's a slow pause. We call this the melancholy pause. Okay, so you're thinking, you're thoughtful as to what's happening. You're trying to remember what the last comment that was said. And that's, you know, that's a little bit, little bit longer. Well, then there's the pregnant pause, and that's the phlegmatic pause. Okay, so as a phlegmatic, you need those extra you know, seconds and, and to be able to kind of put your thoughts together. And again, it's whatever it takes to be uncomfortable. With a phlegmatic, you've just got to wait. Just wait until they're ready to speak again. And several people said that they tried this after the last time we, we got together, and they found that if you'll wait, let that extra couple of uncomfortable seconds happen, many phlegmatics will take up the conversation again. But they need to get to that point. Yes. And so a sanguine. So we've gone through the first three on the pauses. The sanguine, there is no pause, okay? <laughs> Life is too awesome for pauses. There, I mean, if you watch two sanguines communicate, it is just, you know, go, go, go. And, and it's, it's fun to watch, and it's fun to be a part of unless you're a phlegmatic, and then you kind of just take a, take a step aside from that one. Okay, what are you saying? Everybody falls into two categories. They either talk too much or they talk too little. Yes, you can talk too little. Several people mentioned this from the, the last time we got together, that, that that was a surprise. Yes, most people talk too much, so for those of you that talk too little, you're in the minority. But there, there is a group of you, and you know, those that are perceptive in this room know that there are some in here that talk too little. There are things that we could learn from your life if you would share, but your circumstances have made that uncomfortable at times. We all fall into these two, and death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yes. So those that talk too much are, are slashing people. We heard that from the prayer with Brady, that you know, we can pull out a sword and start cutting people. If you, do not, uh, if you do not give life, if you do not speak. You do not give life if you do not speak. So, so what I mean by this is if, if you have experiences the Lord has brought you through, things that can help somebody else, and you don't speak and share those, you are actually killing somebody in a different yes. way yes. by not giving them the life yes. that you could give them 
by sharing those experiences. There's, there's some in here that I know have been through certain things that, that maybe I or my family or the youth could really benefit from, but they're, 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 un, they're unable. I don't want to say they're unwilling, but they're unable to do that. And I, I'm, I'm telling you that there is life in your words. There is life in your experiences if you will share. Yes. You're hurting others by not speaking. You should not question why no one speaks to you if you cannot hold a conversation. So this, this steps on toes, and I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on my own toes. I'm stepping on some of my own family's toes. I understand this, but people, people don't want to talk to you if you can't talk with them. They'll ask you a question, and you don't answer. They'll make a comment, and you don't respond. They try to engage you, and you walk away. Your, 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 your eyes are darting. You're wandering with your thoughts. They don't want to talk to you anymore, and so people can get to the point where I don't understand why no one wants to talk to me. It's because you don't talk. You, you need to engage them in a conversation. You know, a dance takes two people. The other person has to move too. When being asked to speak, please speak. When somebody comes to you with a question or a comment and wants to engage you, please engage for your good, for their good, that you can grow and, Lord willing, they can grow by hearing what it is you have to say. Okay, a couple of verses on the too little. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom. If yes. you are a just person, and we trust that everyone in here to varying degrees is a just person, if you're a just person, there is wisdom that needs to be shared, and we, I'm asking you to, to consider that. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Yes. A virtuous woman speaks. Yes. There are things that come out of her verbally that other people can, can benefit from. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Okay, a wholesome tongue. What do we mean by that? It's a metonym for people speaking, people getting something out there. Wholesome tongue is a tree of life. You can be a tree of life just by speaking. Now, I understand the majority of us need to stop giving so much life. Every, so here's a couple of verses for too much. And we mentioned these last time, but I'll, I'll, for your sake again, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. It doesn't even matter what they're saying, just the amount of them. Yes. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So we've got a contrast here. We just heard that we're supposed to open our mouth and say things, but yet here we're, we're being told to hold it and shut it. So you need to understand which one you are. And that's why I started with yes. we all fall into two categories. Yes. And if you don't know which one you are, then go to a counselor, go to a parent, go to a friend, stay away from the friends, go to somebody else and ask uh, if, you're, if you're the one that talks too much or too little. Body language. Again, this is important, and it comes out several different ways in these slides, but the most common mistake is that we forget that 80% of what is communicated is through body language and not words. 80%. Studies have been done. It's, it's, uh, they're, they're all over the place to, to look and see how this happens. The problem is, is that none of us really know what body language is. We think it's you know, merely our eyes or merely our hands or merely our arms, and it's not. It's a combination of everything. It's everything that you're doing. It's how you're standing, how long you're standing, the way you're standing, how close you're standing. It's everything. If we could understand that, we would, we would be much better communicators. The problem is, is that the electronic world that we live in, we are losing much of the ability to understand body language, and so we can't, we can't tell what the other person's thinking. And if they don't do a really good job in you know, 150 characters, then we're in trouble when, we, when it gets to us, and we're just guessing on everything. How you say something can be more powerful than what you say. Okay, so how you say it, because they can perceive what you're trying to say very well if you say it the right way. If you don't have the right body language and you say the right thing, they can still misinterpret yes. it because you didn't come across the right way. You weren't engaged in the body yes. language side of it. Not saying something can be more powerful than saying anything. Okay, your silence, not answering a question, and how you use your body language to, to communicate to somebody can actually be more valuable than almost anything else you could say. You're just going to fumble up what your body was trying to tell the other person by the, by the things that you do and the expressions that you have. There are messages that come from our emotions through our bodies that tell the story of what is happening. That's just a way to kind of summarize it, that your body is, is trying to communicate something to somebody else. Through your eyes, through the way you nod your head, all of that is, is trying to speak something. So keep that in mind when you're having a conversation with somebody. They're, they're, they might not even know it, but it's happening. Proxemics. Again, a fabulous study. It's neat to understand how it works. Uh, it's, a, it's a big body of knowledge, and so just briefly... You know, this is, this is used by a lot of different areas of our society, but, you know, one, one that I found fascinating was how the CIA uses it. I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. You know, interrogation tactics, stick somebody in, a, in an open room and then periodically walk in, get inside their personal space, scare them a few times, look them in the eye, um, and invade their comfort level and do that a few times in a row, and people become so uh, disoriented that they'll start to tell you anything to, for the fear that you're going to walk back in and do it again. 
neat, neat study, good stuff. Um, the, one of the reasons I use this is because it breaks down for us what those personal spaces look like. So there's an intimate space. All right, so if you don't plan to be intimate with somebody, don't stand within 24 inches of their face. It's just, it's just that simple. Um, I'm not going to ask Zach to come up here, even though some of the youth wanted me to, to show how, how this looked at the retreat. Um, some things that happen at the retreat need to stay at the retreat. Um, but uh, yeah, there's things you can do with your body language to be very open to a conversation. And you know, 24 inches is just too close for most people from somebody that you're not going to be intimate with. Um, you know, personal is two to four feet. Okay, when you're having a conversation, you try to try to gauge how far away you are if you're trying to portray a personal uh, pieces of personal information. And then socially, you know, at church, um, on the job, many many times this this is range from four to eight feet. But then remember this: eye contact enhances whatever emotion is being exhibited. The closer you get, okay. So if you're a ways away and you're having eye contact, it doesn't mean nearly what it does. Is that if you get to within two or three feet and you're staring them in the face, it it, it changes everything. Okay. The power of the palm. I'm not going to go into to detail on this, but there's a, there's a study about the, the neurotransmitters, and I'm going to probably exhaust my knowledge there, from the brain to the palm of the hand, and how you use your palms can do an amazing amount of good or bad for, you, for what you're trying to accomplish. So I, I did this with my kids. So if, you, if, if I told you that the back of the building was on fire, and I said, everybody needs to leave the building, and then I said everybody needs to leave the building and then I said everybody needs to leave the building that gives you three completely different pieces of information suggestion probably should get out now okay it's, it was neat because I could I did it at the table and the kids could see it and they knew exactly what I was trying to say and knew which one meant more but when you're talking to somebody and you're wanting to have an open conversation your hands need to be very engaged in the open conversation if you go up to somebody and you're having a conversation like this, everything changes. You know, this, everything changes. Yes, um, you true. Just you know, keep, that, keep that in mind. If your hands are you're clenched by your sides, what, what's that saying? The power of the palm, again, uh, really, really neat to go over some of these pieces. You know, everything we do, we use the palm of our hands. Um, everything we do requires the palm of our hands when it comes to the, the interactions with our body. It's, a, it's, it's pretty neat to, to, to think about. Someone gets excited, you know, yeah. You know, when people are happy, yeah, I mean, there's everything they're doing, they're, they're saying so much to the palms of their hands. All right, social media and technology, nothing you say is private. Um, you can, you know, ask Facebook how that's working out right now. Um, just, just keep in mind, it's, it's timely about Facebook, and, I, you know, you hate that for Facebook. Um, but as soon as you tell somebody something, as soon as you tell somebody something, it doesn't matter if it's on social media or a text message or in person, as soon as you tell somebody, it's no longer a secret of any kind because you just lost control of what you said. Right. You only control it when it's, when it's still with you. As soon as it, as soon as it gets out there, it's, it's gone. It may only go to that one person that you said you were going to tell a secret to, but you can't control that anymore. So therefore, to you, it's True. no longer a secret. True. Answer text or do not give out your phone number. I was told to repeat that, that that's a really good uh, lesson. You know, keep your phone number yourself if you don't want to be communicated through a cell phone. And if you're communicated through it, you know, respond. Close the loop. I was told this was, this was a neat thing to think about when you have a conversation with somebody, especially electronically. Close the loop. Somebody asks you something, you've got to finish the loop by answering the question. You can't, you can't go back and forth four or five times and not answer one of the questions. You leave the loop open, you leave the person hanging, they have no idea what to do next. Be cognizant about electronic communication. Emojis, we could, we could get into what each emoji looks like and why that emoji's face looks that way. Um, the youth are, are you know, going to remember that we had some funny jokes about uh, what actually people think they're saying with emojis and what they're actually saying. I'm not going to tell you a really bad story about a Hershey kiss. Um, so Mr. Sarcastic versus Mr. Charisma. Um, again, this is a list just for you to think about. And it... You know, the list could really go on and on. And we, we, ju we were just given a list in one of the updates that we used at the charity retreat about odious versus gracious speech and attitude. But, you know, a sarcastic person is just looking for opportunities to make fun of somebody. And it may not even be intentional. Okay, it's probably just a bad habit that yeah. person has gotten into. They've just let it, they've let it happen. That is their filler to, to put somebody else down. But for, for somebody else, you know, a, a charismatic person, you know, they're looking for the exact opposite. They're looking for people to like them, so they're going out of their way to think through ways they can lift up and build up and encourage the person they're talking to. 
you know, stays positive, asks about the other person, compliments. I mean, just a list of things that you can do to help be on one side of this chart or the other. I mentioned this. You know, this is a, this is a this is a frightening thing for those that are sarcastic. You know, it's not funny. They don't laugh because they're too too scared to tell you how much it hurts. Here's right. another one: sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is not only untrue, but deeply so. Right. Most people can put up with sticks and stones. It's the words that really hurt. So keep you know that's something that we you know kids learn at a very young age, but that's actually completely untrue. Words words do hurt. Words hurt a ton. Words hurt the most. So we had a question on the retreat. How do I make people like me? Okay, as, you're, as, a, as a youth growing up, you want to know how to make friends. And if you're quiet, you really want to know how to make friends. It's that simple. It's, it's, I mean, it's literally that simple. And I know that seems funny. And wow, Nathan, you put a lot of work into that one. Um, it's, it's just that simple. Okay, I, it, and I'll show you from the, from the Bible. It's, it's that simple. Okay, so the cure for making friends is be happy and smile. Okay, you can't really control a whole lot else initially. You know, there's a, a level you get to where you're, you know, deep with them and you talk about things you don't necessarily talk about with everybody and so on. But to, to make a friend, to, to establish some rapport, you know, this is how people do it. You know, you walk into a room and you immediately know who you want to talk to by the fact that they're smiling and they're happy. You walk into a room yes. with someone that's morose, I mean, you are literally going to the other side of the room and avoiding them. Yes. A smile is a universal way to make someone like you. Studies prove that, that those that smile live longer. There are literal studies that those that make a point to smile more often actually live longer, and they have less wrinkles when they get older. It's just that it's, it's, part, it's part of what happens when you smile. Smiles are contagious. Have you ever seen a person not smile when a little baby smiles? I mean, who can walk up to, to Gabriella right now and get her to smile and not smile back? I mean, it's, 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 it's just the way it works, and it's, it's actually a proven fact that they're contagious. The, one of the studies I read says that a smile to the average person is like 12 full-size chocolate candy bars to the brain. Okay, wow. so when you have a smile, and the way it lights you up and what it does inside you is like a huge sugar rush. Okay, so keep, you know, keep that in mind when you're wanting to talk to people. Smiling can break the first several barriers of a conversation when you're wanting to go up to somebody and, and engage them. So it's an easy way to do it. Smile is an act of uh, an invitation to a conversation. You know, if you smile to somebody when they come up to you, that immediately engages them with you. Yes. A merry heart is like a medicine. Mm -hmm. The Bible says it. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Right. Yes. And that's happy people are just fun to be around. Studies yeah. prove it. Laughter has medicinal benefits. Yes. There's many studies about that. Ecclesiastes tells us to live joyfully. It's one of the things we get in this sin-cursed world is to still live joyfully. And we can. He who laughs, laughs. So we usually go with he who laughs, laughs, wins, but it's he who laughs, laughs. Just a, something to remember, hopefully. What do I say? Quick list for those of you that want to know. How do you start a conversation? Be thankful. Be complimentary. Be careful with requests. You know, you go into a conversation, you start asking questions. Fire, 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 fire. You know, after four questions, everyone's like, what just happened to me? I've got to, got to get out of here. You know, talk about them. People love to talk about them, okay? Just start asking about them, and, and they'll, they'll rarely stop. Learn, learn to tell short stories. It's, um, it's an art to be able to tell a short story. You've got to be able to have a conclusion. You can't write a novel. Okay, those, those are not short stories. Stay engaged. Try to include everybody in the conversation. People love being included in a conversation. Yes. You know, the yes. A-B conversations need to include everybody else when, when possible. Don't over-dramatize. People can't, you know, don't, don't like a drama queen. You, know, you get into a conversation and everything they say is just the end of the world. I mean, it was the worst day ever, and then the next day is the worst day ever again. <laughs> keep, you know, keep it short when you're, when you're doing, when you're getting into a conversation, keep your side short so they don't feel like they're stuck in something they can't get out of. There's nothing worse than being in a conversation that you're trying to be gracious and they're not, and you can't, you can't leave. There's no exit. There's literally no exit. I mean, you... you the power of the apology, we mentioned this. Not all apologies are the same. Just because you said I'm sorry doesn't mean you are. You know, quickly, there's, there's, there's lots of different ones here. And then there's the, you know, there's the but, but, but sorry, which you're not sorry at all. It's I'm sorry, but you really did it. There's the I'm sorry, but you know, next time I'll make sure I don't get around you when I do it. And, you know, the best apology is the one accepted, and that's, that's, for, that's for you. you know, when someone says they're sorry, accept it. Trust them. Hope all things. Believe all things and move on. All right, I want to introduce you to a couple of people. 
and I hope these hit home, and I hope they don't hit too hard, but I was told to go ahead and do it and be as rough as I need to be, as the Bible tells us to be, as I hope you will understand as I go through these. No one's being singled out, but please apply them to you if you need to. Uh, I've, the, the list has been picked because it's, most of them are things that I've done um, or been a part of in some other way. All right, here we go. Hello, my name is Mr. Selfish. This person is who they want to be. It's all, all, all about them. They don't see or hear anybody else. Everything revolves around them. The person starts everything with I, me, my, or mine. Played a little game on the retreat where you were not allowed to use those words. Um, a couple of us made it two or three sentences and just dumped our candy in the container because we were never going to make it any further. Uh, because it's, it's so amazing how quickly we revert to us, something about us. Here's a rule of thumb. Don't let the conversation be more than 50% about you. And that's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. As soon as you realize that you've gotten close to that 50% barrier, you're a selfish person. You need to turn that, that uh, conversation around. I dare you to try it. Okay? It works. And it's really neat to keep that in mind. And as things are happening to you, you're quickly flipping them back. All right. Hello, my name is Mrs. Gracious. She is conscientious. She is intentional. She is aware. She is consistent. She is quiet, quiet until spoken to. I don't think I got that one right. She does not think she is gracious. That's an important point. The, gracious, the most gracious people do not think they're gracious. She wants everybody happy. She's a chameleon. She can change. She can adapt. She moves around with the, the situation. When she's you know, talking to someone that's a cleric, she can talk with a cleric and keep a cleric happy. She can also slow down and, and work through a, a situation with a phlegmatic. A gracious person is able to do these things. Hello, my name is Mr. Bad Habit. All right, this one starts to hurt. If you like to eat or drink something that stinks, you need to love mints. Okay, and I'm just going to run through these quickly. And I, I'm, again, I'm guilty of, of most or all of these, sadly. Um, but if you like to eat or drink something that stinks, you need to love mints. Okay, because everything you eat or drink is going to um, be shared. <laughs> if you like to crack your knuckles, you need to do it when no one can hear you. If you you know, I've sat in, in meetings, and I had some other people tonight tell me when they've sat in meetings before, when someone cracks their knuckles during a silence, oh, yes. unbelievably painful. It, it literally physically hurts my knuckles to hear knuckles crack during a, during a meeting. You, know, it, you, just, you just need to be aware of that, that just because your knuckles need to be cracking doesn't need to mean you, you crack them. I, mean, there's, I could go into some more detail about things that people need to do, but you don't do it in public, and you really don't need to do it much at all. Uh, you know, if you like the taste of ice, and you need to eat it when you're alone. You know, there's a, there's a, it's some true. people like to chew ice, and it's you know, true. you got to, you got to think about it's who true. else is hearing the ice being chewed. <laughs> and it's not, you know, these, I, I highly doubt any of these are intentional. But the, the goal for tonight, the goal for the, the whole communication um, slide and presentation is that we become intentional in everything we do. And if you're intentionally chewing ice, there's a bigger problem. Um, if your throat needs clear, you need to clear the room first. Okay, so there's there's people that just can't you know can't can't help themselves. Then every third word. <coughs> if you like chewing gum, then you need to like talking to yourself. Okay, because nobody likes to talk to somebody that's chewing gum. I mean, I'm I'm sorry, but if you need to get your breath fresh, chew it quickly and spit it out because nobody likes to talk to somebody that's. <laughs> if you like to bite your nails, I'm sorry for you. Um, it's rude, it's gross, it's disgusting, and then to think that you're going to bite your nails and then go shake my hand is just really appalling. Uh, if you don't like deodorant, it's too bad, okay? Because there's, there's people that don't understand that, hey, I just came from work and I didn't have time. You always have time for things like deodorant. There's the infamous ummer. It's the individual that you can't get through a conversation without them um, 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 umming through everything. And the reason they do that is because they didn't really have anything important to say. They just started talking, and to fill the gaps, they use um. Okay, so if you, if, if you feel like you do that, then just think through it. Before you're ready to talk, have your sentences in order and ready to go. There's the weird stare. You know, it's, it, you know, eye contact is 80% of the time, not 99 or 104. It's, you get with some people and they're like, well, I'm going to try this. They said, you know, eye contact's great, and they stand you know, two feet from you and stare at you, and it's like, okay, you know. There's the, there's the cackle. Um, you know, the, the cackle, you know, the person that has to laugh at everything, you know, things that are funny, things that aren't funny, doesn't matter. It's just part of the way they, they communicate. You can't, you can't do that and have a you know, real conversation with somebody. There's the phone checker. Don't check your phone when you're having a conversation with somebody. Please. Right. It's just, it's so rude. Uh, there's rarely ever going to be an occasion where you have to check your phone immediately. I mean, excuse yourself from the conversation. Do something. Go to the bathroom. I mean, there's, there's, there's ways to get out of a conversation if you have to check your phone. 
Mr. Apples of Gold and Pictures of Silver, he wants everybody, everybody wants to hear them, okay? Everybody knows when that person's talking, I want to be part of that conversation. There's some in this room that every time they open their mouth, people flock to them, okay? They can barely get from their pew to the door because there are people that surround that person wanting to hear more about what they have to say. They speak kindly, they're engaged in the conversation, eye contact, uh, eye, yeah, eye contact is, is, is appropriate, they're polite, they speak with purpose, they never criticize, okay? Now there's, there's a time and a place to correct somebody, but they don't do it in a conversation and criticize them, especially in front of other people. You know, they don't correct unless necessary. You know, there's, there's people that get into a conversation and everything's wrong. They've got a better way to say it. They've got more detailed, uh, more pieces of the details. You feel smarter after hearing them. Okay, have you ever walked away from a conversation? You actually feel smarter having sat and listened. Okay, there's Mrs. Opinionated, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out of time here real quickly. And, you know, she's always got an idea. She always has the answer. She always has a solution. She certainly has a voice. She has experience in everything. She's the best counselor for everything. Here's a side point. One of the very best ways to ostracize yourself, especially in the workplace, is to have a strong opinion about something not related to work. Let politics come up. Let religion come up and get really opinionated about it, and you'll completely ostracize yourself from any future conversations because you can't control yourself, and they can't, con they can't um, uh, be have confidence in you to be able to have a conversation without your opinion coming out. So, Beautiful. All right, my story is better than yours. I love this guy. Okay. <laughs> This is one of my biggest problems. You're in the middle of a conversation and someone is trying to, to relay some information to you through a short story. And uh, as soon as they, you know, as soon as they, there's a little bit of silence, as soon as they start to get to the meat of the matter, boom, here he comes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there. I've done that. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it. No, that I was, had so much fun. Well, what, 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 did, what did you just do? When somebody's sharing an experience, the very last thing you want to hear, they, they want to hear is your experience. I mean, it is literally the very, very, very last thing. That's why they're telling you their experience. The whole purpose of the conversation was for them to share something with you, and boom, you're right there with your better story. People do not want a solution all the time. They want you to listen, okay? We all go into conversations sure that we're going to help this person that have some great dilemma they're going into. They don't want help. It isn't even a dilemma. They just want to share something with you, and we've blown the whole thing up by just jumping all over them with our great story. It's very rude to say, I know because. Okay, so it's not a way to, to, to have a conversation with somebody. I know because. You do not know because you never let them finish. Because they got halfway there doesn't mean that you know how the, how the that's conclusion right. ends. Okay, you don't read a book halfway through and assume what happened at the end. You finish the book and you know for sure. Okay, a couple of final thoughts here. And this is to conclude the four, the four points from earlier. God has written you a personal letter about everything that matters. Speak with God and not at God. If you can do these first two bullet points, communication is much easier on every other level. A spouse, a family member, a coworker, a church member. If you can get these first two down, you have something good to say, and now you know how to say it because his word tells us how to do it. Listen with intent and know what you are saying. Everything you do communicates something. Everything you do communicates something. Silence communicates that you're silent, that you're not listening, or that you're quiet, but everything you do communicates something. I mentioned the dance. Many different kinds of dances, many different kinds of conversations. Okay, usually two parties. One must lead, one must follow. They both must keep up for a conversation to make sense and, and work. Every movement matters. One person missteps, they're going to get their toe stepped on. Their, their toe stepped on. The better you get, the more enjoyable it is. So the more you practice, the more you become good at something, the more enjoyable it is. I am pretty sure David Jones had the most fun dancing, besides maybe Alice, at the, uh, the wedding because he knew what he was doing and he was dancing with everybody. He was having a great time. Um, you know, Zach and Sarah seemed to have a pretty good time too. Uh, you know, once you learn the basic steps of dancing, you can learn almost any dance. Once you learn the basic steps of communication, you can learn just about any part of communication you need to. Last thought. Communication is one of the few things that continues after death. Okay, this is something that, that hit me after the, the presentation two weeks ago. After you pass away, you are still communicating. How you lived continues to speak. What you did during your life, the communications that you had during your life are continuing to speak from the grave. Your legacy is what you communicated during your life. How you acted, things you did, who you spoke to, how you spoke to them. All of those things are continuing to go on even though you've passed away. One of the greatest abilities we have in life is the ability to affect others. 
Okay, so it's a, something the Lord has given us as humans, especially as Christian humans, the ability to affect other people with our lives. What effect are you having? So you're, we've learned about communication, and now I ask you to, to conclude everything. What are you doing with your ability to communicate? Are you affecting others in a righteous and godly and beneficial way? Thank you. Outstanding, Nathan. Yep. Outstanding. Yep. Amen. Thank you.